Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to kick off our first panel today. I'm going to introduce our distinguished panelists in a moment, but if, if I can, let me just cut right to the chase what we're trying to accomplish in this first panel. We're really trying to achieve a shared understanding first that pandemic and disease threats are real, they can spread rapidly across the globe, and that can result in massive loss of life, illness, and disruption to the global economy. Second, the CDC is continuously working 24-7, mostly behind the scenes, to protect us from these threats, and in fact is the leading organization in the world doing so. And third, as a result, a strong CDC is vital to our national and global interest. So uh, let me move right to our panelists, starting with uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant, who's president of Skoll Global Threats Fund. You know, I once knew a guy named Shoemaker who actually made shoes, but that was the closest I came to having a name that describes the attributes of the individual, as well as Larry Brilliant's last name. So Larry worked for the World Health Organization on smallpox, on polio, on blindness. He served as an orgal executive director of Google.org. He took the Epidemic Intelligence Service training here at CDC. He taught epidemiology at the University of Michigan, and he's also served as the CEO of public companies and startups. And he was also an advisor to the Bush administration on biosurveillance preparedness. Larry, thank you for being here. Next, next to me, Dr. Ann Shuckett, Assistant Surgeon General and Director of CDC's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, and is a special person. She is one of CDC's top leaders in the area of disease detection and control. And among numerous assignments around the globe, she's worked in West Africa on the meningitis vaccine studies, in South Africa on surveillance and prevention projects, and in China on the SARS emergency response. Last and certainly not least, Dr. Ali Khan, who's retired Assistant Surgeon General, but by no means retired because he's presently Director of CDC's Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response. Ali is responsible for all of CDC's public health preparedness and response activities. He's led and responded to numerous high-profile domestic and international public health emergencies, such as monkeypox and avian influenza. So let's jump right into it, and my first question is going to be to you. In the year 2011, there was a movie, Contagion. By, by the way, how many people here saw the movie Contagion, just by show of hands? Oh, good. Most of you did see it. Thank goodness, because it told such a good story about CDC. Now, you may have remembered that Kate Winslet was one of, it was really one of the key stars of that movie and her character was directly based on the work of CDs, CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Services officers. In fact, Kate Winslet shadowed you for a day here at CDC, is that correct? So, you know, most people don't have a Hollywood star shadowing them. It's never happened. I didn't turn around and, you know, see Tom Hanks watching what I do. Some people thought Billy Crystal may be sitting in my chair, but um, <laughs> So that had to be quite an experience. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it definitely changed the way that my nieces feel about me at this point. <laughs> um, it was pretty exciting. But you know, we weren't really surprised that somebody wanted to make a big movie about CDC, because I think those of us who work here feel like it's an incredible place. You know, we've got all the villains that you could want in terms of an array of nasty viruses and other pathogens. Um, and they're changing all the time, so they become even scarier. And there is a lot of drama in what we do. Um, you know, I remember flying into Beijing to, to help with the SARS response. The airplane was empty. The flight attendants were wearing masks. I got there. We were in a high-rise hotel. The only people staying there were the 15 of us on the World Health Organization team. The Chinese had commandeered 16 hospitals just for SARS patients, and then they moved all the other hospital, uh, patients to other hospitals. And even just one of the stories, the, the, uh, a man flew from Hong Kong to Beijing um, bringing the virus with him, infecting other people on that airplane. He collapsed in the emergency room in Beijing, and six of the seven people who resuscitated him themselves came down with SARS. When he, um, one of his nephews contacted the public health investigator that I was working with, with just the message, you know, please pray for us. It was, it was a really extraordinary experience. I think the other thing is that CDC has these incredible characters, um, some of whom probably should be in movies. Um, so it, it, was, it was very neat to have you know, the, the movie team here, but I think it, it was uh, meaningful for everybody at CDC to see public health actually be the good guys. Just to refresh your memories, let's, let's take a quick uh, look at a clip from the, from the movie Contagion. Somewhere in the world, the wrong pig met up with the wrong bat. The 
the virus contains both bat and pig sequences, and then the virus attaches to the cell like a key slipping into a lock. Honey? Oh, Beth, Beth, hey, hey. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. I'm sorry. Okay. Can I go talk to her? I want you to move away from the table. Should I call someone? Call everyone. You ever seen anything like this before? No. And it's still changing. It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It doesn't have anything else to do. We have 47 cases. Over 3,000 cases. 18, 9,000 cases. The death toll has now reached 2.5 million. If we even had a viable vaccine right now, we would still have to do human trials, and that would take weeks. Then we would have to get clearance and approval, figure out manufacturing and distribution. That would take months. How fast it multiplies depends on the incubation period, how long a person is contagious, and we need to know how big the population of people susceptible to the virus might be. In 72 hours, we'll know what it is, if we're lucky. Clearly, we're not lucky. When the word goes out, there will be a run on the banks, gas stations, grocery stores, you name it. People will panic. The virus will be the least of our worries. It will tip over now. On day one, there were two people with it, and then there were four, and then it was 16. But next, it's 256. In 30 steps, it's a billion sick. Three months. It's a math problem you can do on a napkin. And that's where we're headed. I have to tell you, when I saw that movie, I had tears in my eyes, and my wife said, you know, do you feel that close to the characters here? I said, it's not because of the actors, it's because the work of the, of the CDC is finally being told. Larry, I have a series of questions for you, because you were actually one of the scientific advisors, one of two, for the creation of the movie Contagion. So a few questions. One, why did you decide to be an advisor for creation of this movie, highlighting the CDC's work? And is this just the stuff of Hollywood? I mean, Anne's given us a little bit of a sense, but you look at that, it looks quite dramatic. Where could a pandemic of this nature actually happen? And how do we balance you know, the fear that could be created in, in, in exposing this with overcoming possible complacency that people don't realize that it could happen? Well, first, it's great to be back at CDC. Um, so, so the origin of the movie, uh, Jeff Skoll, who's the uh, principal of a company called Participant Media, uh, and uh, Steven Soderbergh, who's the director, uh, started talking about uh, doing a movie about pandemics. Um, and uh, uh, Mark Smolinski, my colleague who's here in the audience, and myself work at a, uh, a foundation that Jeff Skoll started, uh, Skoll Global Threats Fund, and they asked us to work with uh, uh, Scott Burns, who was writing the script. And I think we had two principal motivating uh, issues. First, H1N1 had just occurred. And, and do you remember that moment when everyone for, for a second thought, oh God, they've overhyped it. You know, they got us all scared. And look, it, it may have gone and affected a lot of people, they didn't die. And, and there was this moment of almost rebelling against the accuracy and authority and predictive ability of the public health community. Those of us in that community, we know how damn lucky we were. We know one or two unhelpful mutations, a little genetic shift or drift. And that virus not only could have infected two billion people, it could have killed a high percentage of them. So we wanted to show what a real pandemic looked like and we wanted to have the science perfect. And there weren't just two uh, scientific advisors, there were a dozen, and we worked like crazy. My personal goal was that I wanted to showcase what CDC did. I didn't want it to be the best kept secret uh, in the public health world or in the rest of the world, because I love CDC, and anybody who's ever touched it has tremendous regard for it. We modeled the characters after uh, composites of many people at CDC. I wanted people to respect the work that not only CDC does, but federal workers in, in all areas that don't get that kind of respect. So I was really happy with the balance that came out of it. Um, uh, no one ever attacked the science, and no one ever thought that it was hyped, and I think people came away with it with renewed reverence for the work that CDC does. Thanks, Larry. Ali, let's turn to you. So from your experience, you've worked on these matters all over the world. If there is a global pandemic, where do you think it might be most likely to start, and how might it spread? And 
once it starts, let's say it starts in a particular country, how difficult would it be to contain that type of threat? Thanks, Gary. That's a great question. And in these parts, we don't talk about if a global pandemic is going to start. Uh, we really talk about when and what will be the next global pandemic. Uh, these global pandemics really have been generation defining. You know, whether it was the Spanish uh, influenza of the Great War, uh, whether it was polio and iron lugs of our elders, or whether for our generation, uh, HIV, AIDS would be a global pandemic that's uh, defining. And once upon a time, before it did its social engineering to become a global pandemic, it was a disease amongst chimpanzees and non-human primates uh, in Africa. So these pandemics are always occurring. You ask about where could they come from? So I can give you a tour of the world just sitting here in Atlanta. So you get vaccinated currently every year. H1N1 came from Mexico, as you heard. A lot of these flu viruses tend to come from Asia. Anybody vacationing in the Key West, you got dengue there for the last three or five years, came to you from the Caribbean. For those of you who hang out in the western part of the United States, plague came from China in the 1900s, found a home amongst prairie dogs and said, oh, we're gonna stay here in the United States. You get your kids vaccinated. Most of the diseases you get your kids vaccinated against came from Europe. Uh, oh, and you're here in Atlanta today. Uh, the reason you're in Atlanta is because our genesis was from a malaria control program, which we eradicated here in the United States, eliminated here in the United States. Malaria wasn't endemic to the United States. It came from Africa. So pandemics can start anywhere. And that really goes to the point that we really need to detect, respond, and prevent these pandemics at their source. And what we need is your help to help us do that, to scale up what we do very well in the United States to keep Americans safe from all public health threats, no matter what their nature, and to try to do that globally in conjunction with you. Thanks, Ali. Let me just turn right to you then, Ann, and say that, okay, we can get alarmed about these threats. They could result in the loss of millions of lives, potentially. But that's why the CDC is here. That's what we have the CDC for. So what does the CDC actually do to protect us against these threats. And just quite openly, do you feel that there are the resources, the support, is what you need to do this well? Is it sufficient? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, a threat anywhere is a threat everywhere, and these diseases really are a plane right away. So our mission is pretty enormous to deal with that. We have to be ready for almost anything happening almost everywhere. And we have a couple strategies. Um, first of all, here at our headquarters, we have um, incredible scientists, you know, experts in everything you can think of, diseases that really don't happen anymore, as well as the current threats. But we've also got people in CDC staff in over 50 countries working day to day to save lives and keep people healthy side by sides with the Ministry of Health in those countries, building up trusting relationships and partnerships and there to help with the new disease threat of the day. Um, we've also got um, in, in just an extraordinary workforce here that's committed really, truly 24-7 to whatever it takes. So I think about um, universities and companies having great scientists as well, but our scientists have to not just be great, they are on call pretty much all the time. During the anthrax response, during the H1N1 pandemic, we had cots in the laboratory. There was just more to do than we could keep up with on many days. Right now, our big challenge is that um, we're only as protected as the weakest link out there, and diseases can emerge anywhere. So we're really keen right now to strengthen the capacity of other countries so they can protect themselves. And that's an area where we definitely need, need help. You know, we, can, we, we, we know we're at risk, we know what needs to be done, but we can't do it alone. And so we know that partnership and support is important for that. Um, we can look at what happened in China. Ten years ago, you know, I was there for the Beijing response to SARS. China was very much criticized, slow to respond, not transparent, didn't have all the tools they needed when they were responding. Night and day now, you know, last spring, the first case of this H7N9 new scary bird flu strain emerged. The Chinese did whole genome sequencing. They posted the information. They reported it widely. You know, they were real models of capacity 
and partnership with the rest of the world. At CDC, we take pride in that because we've been working with them over influenza for years, and we really think we help them get that extraordinary capacity. Many other countries need that and don't have it yet. So we think there's a huge opportunity to strengthen all of our protection by helping other countries. Um, and so we do need your help, and we're just thrilled to have you here and look forward to talking with you during breaks. You know, a few minutes ago, you began to take us actually through a, a real circumstance when you talked about SARS. Can you take us a little deeper, put us into your shoes for a period of time, one of your past uh, you know, areas where you really went deep on a disease threat? Yeah, let me just say a little more about SARS, because before I even went to China, you know, at, the real story is during 2001, I was part of the anthrax response, and I had a behind the scenes but very exciting role here in our emergency operations center, which was an old auditorium before we had an emergency operations center. And so when SARS broke out in March, of, uh, we, we were, it was clear it was breaking out. I was going to have a quiet role, not do anything, and my staff were going to have all the exciting roles. And what CDC did in those first weeks was extraordinary because the virus was first identified here. And our lab didn't just identify the virus. They made these new diagnostic kits. They shipped them around the world so everybody could figure out if they had SARS or not because you couldn't tell what was SARS without these lab tests because it looked like other severe pneumonia. So the, the folks here were just extraordinary in working out that response. And then I, I got to go in the field. So what really happens is, you know, we have this elite core of disease detectives, the epidemic intelligence service officers like Kate Winslet. They're trained in outbreak investigation. They hit the ground running, and they know they can call back to the mothership for good information when they need it. And then we have these extraordinary laboratory scientists who really characterize things. But at CDC, it's not just about what's going on. It's about what can we do about it. And so very early in any response, we want to find the source. We want to find what works. We want to get that intervention out there quickly. In SARS, we didn't have drugs. We didn't have vaccines. But we had really good infection control exquisitely applied that actually stopped the spread of the virus. And I'm not exaggerating if I say literally when the CDC EIS officers or others go into the front lines, you're literally putting your lives at risk. So I want to be careful about this. So I've done Ebola outbreaks, Rift Valley fever outbreaks, Marburg outbreaks. Congo Crimean hemorrhagic, all these wonderful exotic diseases that are spread person to person, 70 to 80 percent of people die. We don't lose EIS officers, so <laughs> I want to encourage people to apply <laughs> to EIS and join us, <laughs> okay? Our job is to prove, even under the worst possible circumstances, that we can keep you safe. And these are the prevention measures that will help keep you safe. So this is why, you know, when bad things happen, CDC is rushing there as opposed to rushing in the other direction. So no, EIS officers, we, please join us. <laughs> but you're putting your lives at risk. Uh, so Larry, CDC is not the only public health agency in the world. And why should we rely? I mean, the world relies on us. This is not just protecting our nation. But you know, I know from the work through the foundation and the privilege I have to be associated with CDC that every disease threat that I've heard about, CDC was there quietly behind the scenes. It's a very humble organization. It does not ever seek public exposure or credit. But we're always there. So why, why should we be the go-to agency of the world? Why don't we just let? other countries take responsibility, or maybe they can help us out with our disease threats? You know, first of all, I think CDC is about the best organizations you could ever partner with. Um, and I've had the privilege of partnering with CDC, of course, on the movie, but when I worked at WHO, when I was a professor, uh, when I was at Google and we were working on uh, new digital disease detection systems, and now at a foundation. And, and that's just the beginning of a whole long list of relationships that CDC has. You probably have all seen this poll that of all government agencies, the American public most respects CDC. You may not know that's true all over the world, that when other organizations of the United States are, are viewed with ambivalence or concern or respect or not, CDC is always the most respected. Yes, there are other laboratories, there are the reference laboratories, but CDC is the reference laboratory of all reference laboratories. You know, I worked in the smallpox eradication program for 10 years in India and Bangladesh and Burma and all over Asia, but it was CDC that eradicated smallpox. I mean, WHO was the vehicle through which smallpox was eradicated. 
but the ideas, the strategy, the uh, inspiration, the perspiration came from CDC. And you know, right now, uh, the world faces two possible scenarios. It's a fight of, of, of lines on a graph. If we do nothing, if CDC is not strong, if there are not new digital de disease detection systems, new forms of regional governance, as Ali said, it, it's not a question of if there'll be a pandemic, it's merely a question of when and which organism. And we're talking not about a pandemic that costs $30 billion. We're talking about a pandemic that costs five or 10% of global GDP where there's no airplane in the air for six months. Where business as you know it, those of you who rely on supply chains, let alone just in time supply chains, will be hit really hard. So that's one possible scenario. And that scenario is made more dire by modernity, by transportation and the way that we move around the world. But there's an equal but opposite force that has come into the world. We have new technology. We have new abilities to find organisms faster than ever and respond to them faster than ever. You know, 10 years ago, it took us six months to find a new pandemic potential organism before it jumped from one person to 10 to 1,000. Now it takes us three weeks. And what's driving that curve down and making it possible to find new potential pandemics earlier is the work that CDC does and its partners, this ecosystem that has developed all over the world around CDC. So no, CDC can't do it alone, that's what Ann said, but CDC, it can't be done without CDC. So Larry's obviously being very modest about his role in smallpox eradication, uh, and eradic so eradication, that's P prevention with a big P, by the way, just to be clear there, and very generous in his description of CDC's role. And let me follow up on that, Larry, about uh, something that I think we'll hear a little bit more about. So during the smallpox eradication campaign, there's a, there's a related virus called monkeypox that occurs in Africa. And there was a lot of work done by WHO and partners to say, okay, once we do this great job of eradicating smallpox, will monkeypox sort of make its way to become the next global threat? And everybody decided, no, this wasn't going to be a global threat. Fast forward 25 years later, and all of a sudden there's this gigantic outbreak of monkeypox in the Congo, and CDC invite, uh, WHO invited CDC and other partners to come and help them think about, do we need to reinstitute smallpox vaccination in the Congo again because of this uh, increase in monkeypox? And that was a big deal because when we eradicated smallpox, there wasn't HIV AIDS and other immunized, uh, immune deficiency conditions across the world. And so trying to do that now would be pretty much almost impossible for that disease with the way we did it. And so we went there, figured it did the wonderful science and said, no, this isn't a risk. Fast forward another decade and all of a sudden we see these kids in Indiana with these rashes on them and nobody has any idea what's going on. And it is monkeypox. So some of the work that CDC, and this is a good example of how you, when you get it right, because the work that CDC did, they knew they had the right diagnostics to figure out what was going on. They had figured out what the animal hosts were. And so some of these animal hosts made their way into Texas. And there's this lovely phenomenon in the United States called pocket pets. So if, there's lots of people who think prairie dogs are really cool pets, um, in addition to all sorts of other interesting things. And you go to these little swap meets and they sort of move these prairie dogs around that got infected from these animals from Africa and these young kids uh, in the United States were getting these bites. And we knew how to make the diagnosis, we knew how to treat them, we knew what prevention was, and we had the good sense to say, whoa, we're not gonna do the plague story again where we get the whole US infected with monkeypox. So we went around rounding up all those little prairie dogs to make sure they weren't released to the wild. By the way, uh, you may have missed it, but as you came in, if you came in with a prairie dog in your pocket, you were, <laughs> there was a sign that said you have to leave it here. You're not allowed to bring it in the building. So if anybody has one, please bring it back. But you've just given us a, a very interesting insight sort of into the details of surveillance and containment of a threat. I, I would say, Ali or Ann, can you give us, you know, one of the interesting or intriguing aspects of working with CDC is you get to hear these inside stories without breaking confidentiality. Are there some other stories you could tell us about when you were sort of on the inside, things that the general public would uh, normally not hear about? Well, why don't I start? And so Ann and I have done dozens of outbreaks together, including the anthrax outbreak where I had the opportunity and honor of serving it. Uh, in Washington, D.C. to help them with that response. So 
confidentiality and thank you, that's really important. So think about what happens during a pandemic or an epidemic situation. You disrupt supply chains, you disrupt your employees, you disrupt your com uh, customers, you put travel bans and, uh, in place, you prevent the movement of goods. So you need to have that great relationship with countries for them to trust you with their information so that you can work with them and try to quickly you know, uh, help them take care of this at the source so that it doesn't spread globally. Um, I can give you a little peek behind the scenes here about something that we're doing. So hopefully in the next two weeks or so, you will become aware of this new global health security agenda. And this is across the US government approach with many partners in WHO to help globally help countries really detect, respond to, and prevent diseases at their source. Now, my boss, uh, who he's, he calls it an obsession with data and impact, and it's all about accountability. He calls it a healthy obsession. There's probably other words, but I really don't want to be reassigned to the vessel sanitation program and you know, with cruise ships stuck in Antarctica. So I'll call it a healthy obsession with impact. And you know, there's lots of these global capacity building activities. And what he asked us to do and, and challenged the agency to do was to say, what are the specific things we can do in countries to make a difference? And so this whole new global agenda is going to be based on a pilot that was conducted here at CDC over the last 18 months or so in Uganda and Vietnam, where we specifically said, how do we strengthen your Epi your disease monitoring systems, how do we strengthen your laboratory systems to things that matter to you. So for example, in Vietnam it was flu. And how do we strengthen your emergency management systems? And so we helped them set up emergency operation systems. We helped them practice this. And it was because of these concrete efforts and showing that we can really have an impact in this country that we hopefully, with your help and other help, will be able to scale up. I do want to say one thing about China before I go to Anne. So, and I think Anne's a good point. So Anne's kind of a celebrity in China. Uh, uh, so when uh, the Prime Minister Zhen Shu was here about three years ago, he said, Ali, I'd like you to come to China and do a national assessment for us of our health security systems. Uh, after I had a little chuckle that, you know, how big China was, I said, okay, we'll come and have a look at what, what you do. So I went out there with a CDC team, and again, this is inviting CDC to come and look at their systems. Uh, and they had made lots of progress uh, since SARS, and Anne sort of talked about that. But my job was to say, okay, what doesn't work well? So I would walk into the ministry, or I'd walk into a provincial health department, and they go in Chinese, and then I'd hear Anne's name, and they go, oh, you know Dr. Shuketh, how can we help? And then... <laughs> And then all of a sudden they tell me all sorts of things you wouldn't tell people, which is even though they have this fabulous response and ability to respond, they don't have an incident management system. So every time they have an emergency, they go, okay, who's in charge? How do we put a team together? They don't do after action reports to try to figure out how you do things better. Uh, they don't um, worry about responder safety. Uh, they don't have sort of the systematic way to deal with the responses that we did. So I had the opportunity because, thank you, Anne, because they were really willing to say what the problems were to try to concrete help China respond to outbreaks. And I don't need to do a show of hands of how many of you have customers in China, supply chains in China, employees in China. You want that country to be a lot better if there's a nat natural disaster, if there's a pandemic, if there's a bioterrorism event. So that's just one other example of how we work with countries. And you want to give us an example or two? Uh, you asked sort of for a little behind the scenes thing, so I thought I would just take you back to the beginning of the H1N1 situation in 2009. And I think we've talked a little bit about you know the lab and the epidemiologist disease detection, but for CDC, really the centerpiece is information. Uh, we want to have the right information and to get it out quickly. Um, when um, we first became aware of these cases of this totally new um, influenza strain in children in uh, Southern California, we reported it in an MMWR early release, said, you know, we don't know what this is, two, new, new, two people with this totally new virus, just let us know if you have anything else. We got reports of five more cases, and so on the Thursday in April of 2009, 
um, I was asked to do a press conference. Um, we had seven people in the US who had this totally new influenza virus, never be seen in people before. They were all fine. Half of the reporters at the press conference wanted to know, why are you having this press conference? But the other half of the reporters wanted to know, is it the end of the world? <laughs> Because basically, for years, we'd been talking about bird flu in China and planning on, you know, it was going to start in Asia. We were going to be, um, you know, getting our act together before it came to us, you know, helping, helping wherever it started. Um, but we were taken by surprise that, you know, it started really in Mexico. The first cases were detected from a research test that we were doing with the San Diego Naval Medical Center. Um, people thought the kit was broken because it got these weird results right away in the first run of the tests. But that um, media experience for me was really threading that needle between fear-mongering and complacency. We didn't know if it was going to be a problem or not, but we wanted to tell people about it. We wanted to say, we don't know, but we'll tell you more when we know. This is what you can do now, and this is what we're doing to try to find out more. I think at CDC, that, that balance between the hype and the lead foot is very tricky, but we're um, really committed to have good information, to get it out quickly, and you know, to, to be as strong as possible so that information's reliable. Let me pick up on that uh, theme of information. Just uh, in the smallpox eradication program in India, we had 150,000 workers who went to every house in India once a month, knocked on the door, looked for cases of smallpox. We made over a billion house calls. That was dwarfed by the polio eradication program, which has five million volunteers going all throughout India. This degree of house to house, human powered all over the world, that's yesterday. Now we have new digital disease detection systems. We don't have to go to people's homes because to go to people's homes, you have to know where you're going. But with the cloud, you can go anywhere you want in, in the moment of imagination. At Google, we built something called Google Flu Trends. We captured every single keystroke that had ever been entered into Google. We used 10 million computers to be able to compute where influenza would be next. And now, there is something that you can participate in and your companies and your employees can participate in. It's called Flu Near You. It's online now. There's 100,000 Americans using it right now. Where you actually, every week, you're asked, are you sick or are you well? You have a chance to be part of this new idea and experiment called participatory surveillance. If we can get good at that, if we can do it for influenza, and for gatherings and other diseases all around the world, we'll take yesterday's idea of going house to house and knocking and move it into the future and be able to find these new potential threats earlier than ever and respond to them earlier than ever. And CDC is the, our partner in that and is really at the heartthrob of all of that. So you've just touched upon how this affects us as individuals, and I think you know, there's nothing more personal than a health impact either within oneself or within one's family. You know, a flu epidemic hits, and the first thing you think about is you know, when's the vaccine going to be available, when we're going to be able to access it. Let's talk also about collective impact. You know, in addition to chairing the foundation, I, I have a day job, and that's as, as executive vice president of Becton Dickinson. And during the flu pandemic, H1N1, we actually, in our formal processes with our board of directors to measure risk, we actually identified flu pandemic as the number one risk to the company. We do business in over 50 countries. We have substantial operations in China. And we recognize that under the worst circumstance, it could literally shut us down. So let's talk a little bit about the broad implications. What could it do to the global economy, national economies? school systems, government. Give us a sense that if one of these pandemics really grows, or if there's a bioterror threat, we haven't spoken much about this, but the CDC is also the leading agency understanding how bioweapons could have a similar impact by intent. So who would like to jump in on that? Yeah, I just want to say one thing. You know, if you think about these threats, um, when they start, they're a lot easier to control than when they spread. And I have to say, when I was in China working on SARS, and we were able to stop it, um, and with the clinical work I'd done in the past, the thought that if we could have found AIDS earlier, if we could have been there decades earlier, we could have saved so many lives and spared impact on so many countries and, and, and economies. And the whole idea is to you know, find the threat early, stop it at its source before it is very difficult to control. 
But with pandemics, you really have second, third, fourth order impacts. Um, with SARS, it was the kind of overreaction of stopping travel and trade. You know, we didn't really need to do that, but that's what was done. Um, so I, I really think these, um, the, the full impact, you know, if you see the movie Contagion, complete civilization ends. But I, I actually think um, for us, it's really about getting there faster so we don't have to have those impacts. And, you know, microbes don't need passports. And to be honest with you, uh, you know, somebody who's named Ali Khan, who's sporting a beard, they probably have less trouble with TSA than I do. Uh, so, you know, it's anywhere, a microbe can be anywhere in the world. It's a plane right away. You see on Rear Admiral Strickland, you see on Ann's uniform as an assistant surgeon general, you see it as an anchor. And essentially, that's a reflection of the maritime sort of genesis of, of the public health service. You know, the incubation period, how long it takes somebody to become sick, has, been, has always been the most wonderful thing for public health if you're coming over on a ship. It, by the time you show up in, in you know, New York Harbor, we know what you're infected with. Nowadays, that's not true. You know, you can land in any airport in the world and still be infected and then go on and uh, spread the disease. So it makes it very difficult and you really do need to think about the source. And SARS is a great example where essentially one sick doctor, uh, it's a tragic story, uh, knew he was infected, died, and spread the disease from there in one hotel all over the world. And that's a good one where we were able to get that genie back in the bottle. We're not always able to get that genie back in the bottle. But if we can scale CDC's activities, we really can detect respond to and prevent diseases at their sources. We have, we have a lot of folks here from business and who are running corporations, and I, I would uh, guide you towards a publication by the Bank of Montreal written by uh, Sherry Cooper, their chief economist, on the economic cost of a pandemic. We used that when we were making Contagion. We wanted to make sure that Contagion was really the, um, how should we say this, we, we, we took what we really expected and divided by 10. So it wasn't that it was the highest on the risk possibilities, it was the lowest. But uh, Sherry's analysis talks about disruptions in the inventory system. I don't know if you remember the, uh, uh, the volcano in Iceland and how Kenya's entire economy almost failed because the just-in-time inventory system didn't work because airplane travel was shut down. But it analyzes all the different systems, uh, communications, media, transportation, um, all the supply chain issues. It's really interesting. Her, her net response was something on the order of 5% of global GDP. So we're not talking about billions. I said that before, but I want to say it again. We're, we're now talking about five, eight trillion dollars. That's what a, a real pandemic, one that, you know, re, as Ali was talking about the, the Spanish influenza, 1917, 1918 influenza, that's what it would cost today. And um, let's, Let's just make sure that doesn't happen. We don't really want to know what it's going to cost. Let's make that all hypothetical and stop it. There are slight upsides. So I was in Singapore for the SARS pandemic, working with the Ministry of Health to try to shut it down there. And actually, that was sort of the resurgence of quarantine processes uh, in the, and isolation. We started talking about those old public health tools again. But because the economy almost shut down. I mean. Cathay Pacific, one of the largest airlines in the world, almost went out of business. Uh, and the, the slight the, uh, upside of that was for the first time you could find a hotel room in Singapore for a gover government employee because the hotels were completely empty, as Anne said. There was no travel going on whatsoever. So, you know, I, I mentioned last night as well, and, and, and this is not pointing fingers, but you can see, you know, over the last, just this week here in Atlanta, a few inches of snow and some ice could essentially dislocate a city for a day or two. Now, just imagine the dislocation impact if a disease was to spread that kept children home from school, kept people away from work, kept products from being distributed, and kept hospitals from being able to operate. This is very much a potential reality if the prevention efforts break down. So we're, we're down to our you know, closing moments here. We got about five more minutes, and I really want to now bring this home to the most important question, because we would not be holding this session if everything was taken care of, if CDC had everything it needed, there was no real concern, you know, you've heard from these fantastic people, you know, they've got everything under control. The reality is that the closer you work with CDC, the more concerned you are that these threats could become real, not because this agency doesn't have the capability to address it, but they may, may not be getting the support they need to do so. And CDC 
people uniformly. I've worked with CDC people in many countries around the world, in several countries in Africa, in Haiti, and here, and they're universally humble. They never self-promote. They don't boast about their work. They don't look for credit. And as a result, it doesn't bring necessarily to people's attention how important, really essential, this work is. And one other quick comment I'll make is when a disaster happens, whether it's natural or otherwise, always you see this mobilization. The disaster happens, and all of a sudden, for the next two, three months, it's in the media. You get all this mobilization, funding, preparedness to prevent it from happening again. But the very fact that it happened and it caused a lot of damage is what needed to be prevented in the first place. There's very little glory in prevention. The terrible, terrible thing that never happened that nobody knows about doesn't bring that type of glory and therefore doesn't elicit that type of support. So let's get to a bottom line question here. What can we do? We as a collective community of influential people, what can we do to help ensure you can do what you need to do to protect the country, to protect the world against these threats? What is it that, yeah, and what may be lacking today? Yeah, I mean, just simply, we really are vulnerable. We think we know what needs to be done, but we need your help. And your help might be excitement about our mission. Your help might be support in, in that kind of advocacy way. Um, it, but it may be partnership that, you know, you've got the supply chain logistics kind of know-how and some of these global health security capacity building issues in other countries really need that partnership. So I think there's an array of things that are needed. We have the best staff in the world. I mean, our workforce is incredible, but we have gaps. The next generation of bioinformaticians that can help us deal with those big data issues, the equipment to do the next generation sequencing and so forth. There's a lot of, I mean, we have beautiful facilities right now, but we really, um, it, with more, we could do more, and I think we'd be safer. And just let me mention about the laboratories. You may hear about this later, but there was a recent outside assessment done this is the laboratory to the world, the CDC. They have the most fantastic laboratories, but the technologies are out of date due to funding constraints. And this assessment said that there are some junior colleges that now have better equipped laboratory diagnostic technology than the CDC does. It's an intolerable situation. We should never allow that happen, to happen because not only we, the whole world relies on the laboratories and CDC, and that's strictly a funding issue. <laughs> uh, so I could name five things right now. So could any of my colleagues here in this room you know, in my case around information systems, climate change, and uh, uh, global health security, that we don't have the resources to do. Um, and you'll hear more about those. Uh, and so, you know, your advocacy uh, and your personal support, you'll have an opportunity to meet with the CDC uh, Foundation. Now, the snow thing, I gotta get back to the snow thing. So, the threat you've heard, the infectious disease threat is always present. Uh, the director of the National um, uh, Intelligence uh, directorate gave a, uh, was, at, was on the Hill yesterday and pretty much said that we have not decreased the bioterrorism threat and the other threat, the outside external threat to the United States. But we do have, snow, snowstorm aside, we have a comprehensive public health, health security program here in the United States that includes supporting our state and local health departments, which are our first line and making sure we have emergency management systems to connect them. We have good biosafety, biosecurity in labs, uh, and we have the ability to have countermeasures available to them. But we need to replicate some of these systems worldwide so we can really detect, respond to, and prevent threats at their source and protect your businesses, protect your families, protect our communities. Larry, quick last word. Um, I gave a talk at the Renaissance Weekend. It's a bipartisan uh, event in, in Charleston, in, in South Carolina. And uh, we talked about pandemic threats. And after I finished, a guy came up to me and said, because um, you, you know, having, you may have noticed we're having this big debate in the United States about the size of our government, this small thing that's, that's happening in, in Washington. And it, the guy came up to me and he said, you know, I'm the head of the Tea Party uh, here in, uh, in South Carolina. And I've told everybody, cut, cut, cut everything. Cut, cut, cut everything. Make no, no exception, because if you make any exception, everyone will want to have an exception. And then I saw contagion. Now I tell everybody, cut, cut everything. Cut, cut everything, except pandemic preparedness. And I said, well, why? He said, because I just didn't understand. I didn't know. So I, I think if there's one takeaway that I would ask you to take away is understand now. I mean, you do understand now. You're here because you understood before you got here. Let's not kid ourselves. But that's the thing. If you understand 
when, when there's a government shutdown, there may be a reason for a government shutdown, but not a shutdown of CDC. Uh, of all the things that we depend upon that's most vital, that we're most proud of, that's doing the job that we want it to, that shows what government can and should do, CDC is the top of my list. So let's, uh, these are absolutely wonderful public servants. Ann, Ali, Larry, thank you so much, and, and thank you for paying such close attention to what they had to say.